Hey, uh, happy Christ the King Sunday. This is a huge day when at the end of the liturgical year we celebrate Jesus is Lord of all. Great time to realize that uh, we have a good King in Jesus. Also, happy Thanksgiving this week to you, as Zawadi said earlier, and also happy birthday mom, who's worshiping uh, with us from California. Today is her birthday. Well, I, I don't know how you happen to find us. Maybe you got invited to join us today. I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad that you're with us. I know you know most of our friends don't choose to go to church, and uh, it can be a little awkward the first time, but thank you for having the courage to come. Maybe you're trying to discover a little bit more about what you believe or what a friend believes, uh, or you're, you got invited and you're just a nice person and said yes. So thanks for uh, honoring us with your presence. We really are glad to have you here. wish we could see you face to face. Today we're going to talk about Jesus. And I want to begin with one of Jesus's questions. I actually want to reflect on this question. Like, like all great teachers, Jesus teaches more with his questions than with his answers. And this is a big one. So here it is. He, he asks, what do you want me to do for you? That's Jesus. And I, I just want to get you to think about that a little bit today. I mean, what if Jesus asked you that question? What would you say to him? Maybe it would help to put yourself in the scene where he first asked the question. I want to read a little bit from one of the biographies of Jesus. If you'd like to find it yourself, you can find it in the New Testament in a book called Mark, chapter 10, verse 46. But as I read this, you know, use your imagination. Picture yourself on a road, on the side of a road, sitting down, and picture a crowd coming by, and Jesus in the middle of the crowd, and he stops in front of you and asks you, this question. So, here, so here's from one of the biographies of Jesus, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 46. They came to Jericho, that's the crowd, and as he and his, dis- and, and he, as he and his disciples, that's Jesus' disciples, and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, what what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, Bartimaeus regained his sight and followed him on the way. What do you want me to do? For you, that's the question that Jesus asked. Let's think a little bit about this question. Who gets asked a question like that? Uh, Who asks the question? And then what happened? First, who is asked a question like this? And the answer in in our text, in this incident anyways, is a man with blindness. A man with blindness. Somebody who cannot see. Uh, He's sitting along the side of a road just outside a town called Jericho in the first century, and he, um, he's blind, he's begging, he's poor, he's in need. And it's at this moment that Jesus asks him this question. Now, the Bible tells us that we have two sets of eyes, physical eyes and spiritual eyes. It's so interesting in this text, how is it that the one with no eyesight, physical eyesight, has the most insight, sees the most? It has to do with those spiritual eyes. Physical eyes we use to perceive the physical world. Spiritual eyes are meant to perceive the things of God, um, deeper uh, realities, the the mysterious spiritual world. And in this sense, we're all spiritually blind, just like this man Bartimaeus. And only Jesus can give us sight. St. Paul, the apostle prays for people that, quote, the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. He prays that God would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know Jesus, what he says. The Bible tells us that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers 
so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So spiritual eyes. In that sense, we are all like Bartimaeus. Spiritually, we can't see. There's an interesting little side note I want to make here, and that is that Mark tells us that his name is Bartimaeus and that it means son of Timaeus. It's Aramaic, Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. And we don't know any Timaeus in the New Testament or otherwise, but in ancient Greece, this, this person was very well known. There was a Timaeus who was one of the dialogue partners of Plato. One of the Plato's dialogues is called Timaeus, and this would be well known by the people who first read this biography. It, it could be that there's a message here that even at the height of um, academic achievement and intellectual learning, we still come to the limits of what we know. And in some sense, we find ourselves not able to see anything more. So the question is, who would you like to be in this scene? Would you like to be the crowd around Jesus who don't know that they can't see? Or would you like to be the one beggar who knows he can't see? I'll never forget when I first put on glasses. I had my prescription filled. And I put them on, and I thought, oh, my gosh. There was a whole other world out there, right? If you've ever put on glasses, I could see individual leaves on trees. I could see the tops of buildings. I could see airplanes. This is the thing about blindness. You can't see what you can't see. You just don't know. And I imagine that this man had learned something about intellectual humility and the need for God to open up the eyes of our hearts and allow us to see what we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. I had an experience like this when I gave my life to Jesus. I, I, I wasn't used to going to church as a young man. I was not raised in a religious home. I didn't think much of faith. I, I, I probably would have said of faith what Mark Twain says, that faith is believing what you know ain't true. Um, and I had a trajectory for my life that involved success, I think I would have, I would have thought. This is what life is all about. Uh, I, I wanted to get a good job. I, I was primed to be a lawyer. I had a great resume. I would have been a self-made man who worshipped his own maker. And then one day I encountered Jesus through a question in the New Testament, one of the questions. I was a sophomore in college, and I don't remember how I came across the question. Someone probably shared it with me. But it's this question. What does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? And honestly, I was racing to gain the whole world. What I didn't realize is I hadn't even considered my soul. At this point, I began to see that I actually was a person of faith. I had lots of faith. It was just faith in the wrong things. I had faith in myself. I had faith in my education. I had faith in other people. Uh, I, I had faith in gaining the world, success. But I found Jesus was asking me, George, if you got all that stuff, even if those things could deliver what they promise you, which... They probably can't. And you had all those things, would you find yourself satisfied deeply in your soul? I had to, I had to admit, no is the answer to that. No. And Jesus was saying, what if you came to the end of your life and you had the world, but you lost your soul? And so this began a, a process of discovery. And through that process, I, I was, my eyes were being opened and I was seeing more. I was seeing God I was, uh, th through Jesus. I was seeing love. I was seeing life. And there was a transformation that happened in my life through that. The point is, Jesus opens the eyes of those who admit that they do not see, that, they, that we're very much like Bartimaeus on some level. This seems to be what happened to Barbara. <laughs> she, I love Barbara's story. She says she moved from a person who says, I don't believe any of that bleep, to someone who can now say, Jesus is the center of my life. Oh my gosh, her eyes have been opened. And this is the experience uh, that so many people report when they give their lives to Jesus. For some of us, it's a gradual process, like James Chung says, uh, flying from Seattle to Vancouver on a cloudy day. They might ask you when you arrive in Vancouver, hey, when did you cross the border into Canada? And you say, I don't really know, but I'm here now. Gradual process. Or for some of us, it, it, it's a sudden process. Like novelist Frederick Buechner, he, he talks about being in church and hearing the minister and he's kind of droning on, and, but suddenly he uses this phrase, great laughter. 
And let me read what he, he writes because it's so beautiful to me. He says, at that phrase, great laughter, for reasons that I have never satisfactorily understood, the great wall of China crumbled and Atlantis rose up out of the sea. And on Madison Avenue at 73rd Street, tears leapt from my eyes as though I had been struck across the face. <laughs> I mean, somehow God used the phrase great laughter to open Frederick Buechner's eyes to Jesus. And for no obvious reason, he could see spiritually. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. Well, to see, Jesus, I want to I wanna see. I want you to open my eyes. And, and if you're praying that prayer today, um, as I'm praying it for you, you're asking for a miracle. But that's what the story is about, right? A God who does miracles through Jesus. Well, that's uh, who gets asked this question. Someone with blindness. And I'm going to give you an opportunity a little later on in this service to pray that prayer of Bartimaeus, to put yourself right on the curb next to him and say, open my eyes, Jesus. But before we get there, let's ask ourselves, who's asking the question? I mean, we know it's Jesus, but who, who does Bartimaeus see in Jesus, right? And the, and the answer is a king with mercy, a king with mercy. This is the real insight of Bartimaeus. This is what he seems to be able to see that the crowd around Jesus apparently doesn't see. Listen to the way Bartimaeus addresses Jesus as he's passing by. Listen to the titles that Bartimaeus uses. Uh, he, son of David, have mercy on me. They say, someone in the crowd says, Who's, oh, it's Jesus of Nazareth. But Bartimaeus says, son of David, have mercy on me. And then later on in the scene, he comes and he says, my teacher, or some translations will just say Rabboni, which is an Aramaic word, my teacher. Let's think about those two titles. Uh, son of David is a royal term. David was a king, and God promised David that he would have an heir who would have an eternal kingdom. And so Bartimaeus is saying, that's Jesus, this king of an eternal kingdom. And then, and then my teacher well, if, you, if you look at, scholars tell us, if we look at the extant literature of the time, Jews in that day, they didn't use this very often of a, a human teacher. They primarily used this phrase, my teacher or Rabboni, for uh, God in prayer. So Bartimaeus is saying, I'm speaking to a king, and I'm speaking to God. That, that's who Jesus sees. He sees, I mean, who Bartimaeus sees in Jesus, a king with mercy. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. The Bible tells us He's the image of the invisible God. In Him, all things in heaven and earth were created. In Him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. God has stepped onto the stage of human history in a person, a human being, Jesus. The Bible tells us this, this man is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being. He's, it tells us, the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone has immortality, and he dwells in unapproachable light. Wow, this is a beautiful vision the Scripture gives us of, of a great king, but he comes walking like an ordinary person in humility before Bartimaeus. He's a present to him as he's present to us now. Joy Davidman writes about this. Joy Davidman, before she gave her life to Jesus, was a, a communist, an atheist, uh, an accomplished poet. She also was a wife, and her husband at the time was an alcoholic, had been unfaithful to her. She was distraught, found herself alone in her room, fell to her knees. An atheist fell to her knees in a moment of prayer. She, she might have said a moment of weakness. But something happened when she did that. She writes later, all my defenses, all the walls of arrogance and cocksureness and self-love behind which I had hid from God went down momentarily. And God came in. There was a person with me in that room, directly present to my consciousness, a person so real that all my previous life was by comparison a mere shadow play. And I myself was more alive than I had ever been 
It was like waking from sleep. A king with mercy. Not visible with physical eyes, but visible with the eyes of the heart. She just perceives a presence. And this presence now is moving by Bartimaeus. Notice mercy. Uh, Bartimaeus says, son of David, have mercy on me. And that's the right, and that's the right prayer, isn't it? Mercy. Because this is a king who comes to grant clemency. This is a king who comes for the sole purpose of pardon. Now, as soon as people around realize that, notice what happens. There are these voices that say, quiet Bartimaeus. You see that? Shut up, Bartimaeus. They try to quiet him, to quiet him. He only gets louder, but they say quiet because he, this is a king. And you have no right. You're just a beggar. You're just on the outskirts of town. You're not with the important people, the good people, the right people, the in crowd. Quiet, Bartimaeus. And try to silence. You have no claim on this king. You have no right to access this king, to bother him, to deter him. He's got no interest in you. See, they're wrong about that, but this is what they say. I have to tell you that as soon as you cry out to Jesus, you will hear those voices too. I hear those voices. I still hear those voices. We hear those voices in society. We hear those voices in ourselves. We sometimes, tragically, even hear those voices in the church. You have no right to this king. What I found is the only way to minimize those voices is to cry even louder, just as Bartimaeus does, to this king with mercy. Cry out to him because you never hear this from Jesus. He doesn't talk that way to us. If you've been reading this biography in context, the very last thing that the biographer tells us before he tells us what happened to Bartimaeus is the purpose of Jesus, why he came. It's Jesus himself speaking. I'll just read it to you in verse 45. Jesus says, for the Son of Man, he means himself, for the Son of Man came from heaven not to be served, like most kings, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I have come to give my life a ransom and speaks of our freedom at his expense, a ransom. It's the only king that was ever born just to die. A king who came to give his life for those who have been rebels all their lives, and yet he loves them. This is a king with mercy. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But God proves his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says, he made peace with God through the blood of his cross. And this is the good news. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new, new creation. That's the pardon that comes from this king. That's what mercy looks like when we say yes to him. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus is asking you that question today. Now, there are lots of answers to that question. We can ask for sight. We can ask for health. We can ask for restoration of relationships. We can ask for help with jobs or, or, or anything, and he does all of that. But, but when a great king is passing by, you do best to ask him to give you first what he came to give, which is mercy. And that's what Bartimaeus do, does, isn't it? He asks for the right thing. He asks for, for mercy. He's asking for forgiveness. He's asking for pardon. He's asking for reconciliation with God and eternal life, eternal life with this king. That's the thing to start with. And so Bartimaeus asks for it. So a, a king of mercy asks someone with blindness a penetrating question. Finally, let's ask ourselves, well, what happens? What happens? The answer is faith with salvation. Faith with salvation. This is a joyous moment. This is a great incident. 
And by the way, this is what I pray happens for you today as well. Faith for, with salvation. I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity just in a couple minutes to, to join me on a Zoom call. And really the purpose of that is not to, not to interact with me, though I, I'd be delighted to do so. It's for, for you to be able to interact with Jesus and to respond to him and say yes to him, to express faith and receive salvation. See what happens. Bartimaeus is sitting by the curb. He hears a crowd. Nothing wrong with his hearing. It grows larger. It's a large crowd. I haven't heard a crowd like this in a long time. It's coming towards me. And he pulls on someone's robe. What is this? And they say, it's Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. And he cries out for mercy. And somehow Jesus hears. I, I don't know if that's with his physical ears or spiritual ears. Above all the noise of that crowd, the, the big and important people pressing in around Jesus, Jesus hears the poor man, the humble man, the man who cannot see and knows it and cries out for nothing but mercy. Jesus hears. And that is the cry that stops him in his tracks. He stops. The, the text is very clear about this. He stood still. This is the crux of the moment. This is a, this is a pregnant pause. This is the, the, the camera freezes. This is like time and space suddenly just stop and all focus is on Jesus, the king, standing there. What's, what's happening? What's going to happen? Right? What's he going to do? And what does he do? He calls for Bartimaeus to come to him because he senses faith and he's bringing salvation. Call him here, he says. And they do. They get him and they call him. And Zacchaeus throws off his cloak, which some people suggest is symbolic of his departure from his old way of life. Perhaps he used the cloak to beg. And he springs up, notice the language, and he comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now that verb made well is um, one of the great verbs of the Bible. It's the verb for salvation. He has saved you. It can be used of physical healing, but more often it's used of just total restoration that God has come to bring to all of his creation. Uh, salvation, it means rescue. You've been rescued, you've been saved, you've been restored, you've been reconciled to God and to the way things are meant to be. This is the beginning, not just of his physical healing, but of his spiritual healing. Salvation has come. Your faith has made you well. What we realize at this moment is that Jesus is looking for faith. He's walking through that crowd, through that city and through that crowd, looking for faith. When he asks the question, what do you want me to do for you? What he really is asking is, what do you believe I can and will do for you? He's looking for faith. Francis Collins has been in the news a lot recently. You, you know his name. He's the director of the National Institute of Health. He did an interview for New York Magazine not long ago, and in that interview, he said, I came into med school an atheist, and I left a Christian. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, it has to do with two people, mostly. It was, uh, one was a, a patient. The other was a neighbor. The patient was an elderly woman in the late stages of cardiac um, disease. She was dying. And yet she had this kind of peace that a young Francis Collins just couldn't account for with his worldview. He couldn't see it. And one day she asked him from her bedside, Doctor, what do you believe? Meaning about God. Now the neighbor was somebody who just lived up the street that had a relationship with uh, Francis Collins and listened to his questions and honored his questions and one day shared with him a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. A patient and a neighbor. And then one day, a Dr. Collins would write, on a wonderful summer morning in the dewy grass of the Cascade Mountains, I fell on my knees and I said, I get it. I'm yours. I want to be your follower from now until eternity. And that's never changed since that day 41 years ago, he said. Faith brought salvation in his life. And he left med school, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Your faith has saved you. There was nothing Jesus could do in Nazareth. Remember, he's addressed as Jesus 
from Nazareth. When he came to Nazareth, as he did, his own hometown, there was nothing because what did they see? They just saw the little boy with a snot nose that they had known all his life, the carpenter's kid. Right? You're no king. That's what they saw. And he could do nothing because there was no faith there. But when he comes to Jericho, he finds faith. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, gives up uh, his wealth in the presence of Jesus because he finds something better. And Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house, Jericho. And then as he's leaving town, here's Bartimaeus, and he sees faith again. Your faith has saved you, he says. The Bible tells us that, there's an, uh, that for by grace you've been saved through faith. It, it, the Bible says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord or King and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be, you will be saved. That's a promise. The Bible says everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, I share this with friends from time to time, and they say, oh, you know, I wish I had your faith, George. I wish I had more faith. But I always say, it's not about the quantity of your faith. It's about what you put your faith in, right? Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, it could move a mountain. If you have a ton of faith, but you put it in a half inch of ice, you're going to get wet. If you have only an ounce of faith, but you put it in three feet of ice, you could drive your truck across it. It's not about how much faith you have. It's, it's what you put your faith in. Do you put your faith in something reliable? If your faith is in Jesus, even the smallest amount, it is in something, someone who is extremely reliable. You can trust him. He's worthy of your faith. What if Bartimaeus doesn't respond to Jesus? Have you ever thought about, think about that for a second. I mean, what if he doesn't cry out? What if he doesn't ask for anything when Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? What if he doesn't have faith, respond? I mean, I guess Jesus would just walk by. And, and that moment that Jesus created when he stood still would be lost to Bartimaeus. And, and who knows whether Jesus would ever come by Jericho again, whether Bartimaeus would ever have another opportunity to respond to Jesus. Who knows? This is the moment for Bartimaeus, and he seizes it. He responds. And I got to say, this king demands a response because he's so great and because what he's come to do is so important. There's no neutrality. There's no not deciding. There's no not responding. Every response is a response. The question, would our response be faith such that we experience salvation? That's what he wants. In that sense, it's not just Bartimaeus at a crossroads. I mean, Bartimaeus is at a crossroads. You understand that. This determines his destiny in this life and the next, his response to Jesus. But it's not just him. You and I are at a crossroads as well. Anytime we stand before Jesus, it's a crossroads. Now, I love the way Jesus involves other people in this moment. Do you, do you notice that? He, he looks to a few people around him and he says, go, go get him. When he hears Bartimaeus calling, he says, go get him. And they do. They, they, he says, call him here. And then they go to Bartimaeus and they say, take heart. <laughs> you know, essentially, we were wrong about you and Jesus Take heart, get up. He's calling you. And that's what I'm trying to do today. Actually, it's not what I'm trying to do. I believe that's what he's doing. I'm coming to say he's calling you because he's sent me to give you a message. That's what this is about. It, it, his message has always come through others. Uh, we, we, there's always a, f a secondhand experience of Jesus before there's a firsthand experience. I mean, there's someone, right, like a patient or a neighbor uh, who helps us hear the call of Jesus. It might, it's what it was true in my life. It was a hiker, a, a, um, a group of rowers, a guy who played the guitar. They told me, George, the king is calling you. It took me a while to get there, but they, they, God used them. And maybe for you, there's someone in your life as well. It could be a grandparent or a parent. It could be a coach or classmate. Um, maybe it's a neighbor, somebody who sent you the link for this message. Maybe that's the, the person. I don't know who it is, but it's at least me. Right now, it's, it's you and me, and all of these people, they're not trying to be pushy. They're not saying, we're better than you. What they're saying is, this king wants you. This king is calling you. It's a really good thing. How are you going to respond to him? What will you say to him? 
I know very well I can't talk you into responding. If I could, I'd try, but I can't. My messages are just not that good. But here's what I'd say. I do not believe in accidents. I believe you are hearing this story today because God wants to ask you this question, the question of Jesus. He's calling you. So this is my message. A king with mercy asks someone with blindness to experience faith with salvation. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks you. That's between you and Jesus right now. If you want this king and the salvation that he dies and lives to give, I'm going to ask you to come to him right now. Now, if we were together, I would invite you to come forward and stand with me in the front, and I would put my hand on your shoulder, and we would pray together. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we can't do that right now. But so the next best thing is I want to join you in a Zoom call. I want to meet you and talk with you and pray for you. We've got a Zoom call that has been set up right now, and a couple people are there already, and I'm going to join you. If you'd like to join me, if you'd like to respond to Jesus today, come to upc.org slash Jesus, and that'll take you to a page with a button at the top that says Spiritual Advisors. That's me. Click that button, and we'll see each other. What I want to do is I want to pray with you brief, very briefly, just share a couple things, pray with you very briefly, and then um, get some contact information so that we can send you some materials that will help you grow in your new relationship with Jesus Christ for all of eternity. This is a great thing. This is a great moment for you too. Now, if you're like me, as soon as I say, please come to this website and the Zoom call, you're going to start hearing voices inside of you. You go, don't you dare. I would be mortified if you did that. I mean, that's the way I would feel, right? I don't know these people. I'm terrified. Just listen and take it in. But look, this decision is too important not to respond clearly and deliberately. This is a moment for you. You don't know when Jesus will pass by. He's here right now with you. He's getting your attention right now. Respond to him. Show him your faith so that you can have assurance you have received his salvation. That's what it means to join this Zoom call. The Bible tells us that there's an appointed time, once to die and after that the judgment. The Bible tells us the Lord is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Today, he says, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Come to upc.org slash Jesus. Mark this moment forever, the moment that you have been forgiven of all of your sins, past, present, and future. The moment that you, as the Bible says, get pulled by Jesus from the power of darkness into the kingdom of light, the moment that you, as Jesus said, become spiritually alive, born, a new birth in you, receiving the Holy Spirit, eternal life, and the presence of Jesus walking by your side. You never know when Jesus will come by again, but he's here now. There's a presence with you in your room or wherever you are, a presence. He's there. You can't see him, but you can hear him now speaking. Will you answer his question? What do you want me to do for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as uh, some of our friends are now going to this Zoom call, we ask a blessing on them. <laughs> we, we would love to all be able to share our story of how we came to make a decision and give our lives to Christ. And <laughs> it, wasn't beauty, it wasn't beautiful, but it has become beautiful because you're beautiful. And you've done a beautiful thing in our lives. And we pray now for them that you'll do a beautiful thing in their lives. Give them the courage to jump into that call and to say yes to Jesus in a way that's public. Jesus said if we confess him before others, he will confess us before the Father in heaven. Lord, we pray for them now that your Holy Spirit would be at work saying yes and giving them the assurance that they are daughters and sons now because of this response of the great King of heaven, whom we celebrate this Christ the King Sunday in his name.